I'm very pleased that a number of you are getting involved in looking at building performance, but for most people who build buildings, it's another country. You know, one thing is, you know, theory and practice are different. You know, even if you're making widgets, you need quality control on the back of the production line. You've got Nobel Prize winners designing scientific experiments or whatever. They sometimes make big mistakes. Nobel Prize winners who win economics prizes for financial modeling make even bigger mistakes. So you've got to have more feedback, and we haven't had it in the industry, and people are always saying the evidence isn't there. The evidence is there. The evidence is sitting under our noses. People like us have shouted about it, as Adrian said, for rather a long time. We've sort of looked at it, we've distilled it, we've extracted the strategic lessons, we've gone to policymakers and others, and they're like the three monkeys covering their eyes and ears and mouth. And then there's also sort of different learning experiences, which is... Quite, quite important, you know. Engineers like to be told what to do. I'm not quite sure why, because Brunel and Telford, Stevenson, etc., didn't seem to be told what to do. They were much more entrepreneurial. And a quote from Arrow, you know, which relates very much to this. I've seen lots of low carbon designs, but hardly any low carbon buildings. So, as a colleague of Adrian says, who's actually an architect and an economist, you know, clients are the crash test dummies of the design world. And, Here's a new Prius being crashed, and it's got an accelerometer in it, and you know, video cameras and crash test dummies and the rest of it. But normally, when a building's produced, nobody's looking. This is from something we produced 10 years ago called Flying Blind. And here's the gap, which I'll show you in a moment, between the estimated and actual energy and carbon performance of a building. And everybody's got the blindfolds on. This is the extraordinary thing. It's not just the designer and the builder, it's also the client and the facilities manager. And we should probably have had government around here too, or maybe they're, they're slightly benign. What one's find is there's been sort of a conspiracy of denial, because once you've decided to spend the money on some building work, you don't actually want to find out that it's not performing quite as well as you hope. So here's a slide I've been showing for 10 years, so it's really rather boring. But I think it's only just beginning to stick. You know, people are now, I was, I was asked yesterday to a seminar at BRE about the design performance gap. Um, Loughborough University have got a research program on it. I think University College London, I probably turn out you have too. Unfortunately, I think we called it the credibility gap, and that was probably a bit too, if we called it the design performance gap, it might have been easy. But this was the winner of a Green Building of the Year award in 97, I think it was, that I reviewed and there was a publication about it, though it, well, about it and a number of other buildings we looked at in the generalities. And what you've got is this sort of two and a half to one difference between the design estimate and the actual outcome for this building. And this is normal. We've been looking at quite a lot of the schools that have been coming off the building schools for the future program, and they generally use three times the electricity anticipated. You know, again and again and again. And I say there are three reasons for it. There's a bit the designers can't, there's a bit the designers don't count, and there's avoidable waste. So the designers count a third, they know about another third, but they don't count it. And avoidable waste, which is partly because things haven't been put together properly, and partly because they're not used as in the way that the designs are predicted. Sometimes the avoidable waste can be avoided by better management. Sometimes it can't because the designers have put things in there or the builders have put things in there, which are actually impossible to unravel. Now, the problem is that when you've got a result here that's so much bigger than a design estimate, that people want to bury bad news. So that you get this problem of when one's having targets which are unrealistic, there's a conspiracy to hide what's actually going on. And one of the things we tried to do to extract that was to sort of push for display energy certificates to show how they might be done. Now they turned into a bit of a camel too, but nevertheless the camel could be trained to race a bit faster. So the problem is that, you know, for this enormous credibility back, you don't celebrate the fact that you're nearly, almost near good performance for a building in the street, in the street. and actually you can make excuses for some of it, and you can inform some of it further by tuning it up. You're much more likely to bury the bad news. Now, Adrian and I came together in the late 80s when Adrian had been doing a lot of work on what people felt about the internal environments in buildings and particularly starting with a very major study of building-related ill health, sick building syndrome, as it's also been called. And I've been doing work on technical and energy performance. 
And when we found ourselves on the same conference platform talking about the same thing from different directions, so we thought we must work together. Unfortunately, we managed to get some contracts from BRE to start with in the early 90s where we could work together. So this is a result of a BUS occupant survey on a school that ran under Warden a couple of years ago. And I don't really want to say anything about it. We've been um, doing, what, when we work together, Bill does the energy and technical work, and I, I look at buildings from the point of view of occupants. And so you're approaching one from the kind of fluffy human knee end, and the other from the much harder end. And we find that you can get a, a really respectable study of a building done using solid benchmark techniques Bill's um, CBC TM22 energy assessment method underpins his work and other things as well. And the building use studies occupant survey method underpins this sort of thing. Now, this, this stuff has got to be convincing. You can't, it, it's got to be statistically sound and robust and properly sampled because as soon as it ex gets exposed to people like you lot, you start hammering us if we don't do this thing properly. So on this chart, you have got, for those of very low attention spans, the result for a building that is immediately obvious using traffic light in indicators. These are the 12 main variables that we use in an occupant survey. In fact, there are about 50 altogether. And this is for an academy school in London that won a major, a major award in, in 2009. Several major awards. Several, yeah. And, and I can't tell you its name, because when we do these studies, there's a, there's a deal done that only when the client wants this stuff to go into the public domain will I actually name the building. So I will keep completely stum on horror results like this. Where Otherwise, it might go on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> now, the only good thing about it is that it looked good. You know, lipstick on the gorilla stuff. Now, this, it was horrific from the, the, the temperature, the, the main variables, ventilation and air and temperature. Horrific. <coughs> and there was a kind of cascading knock-on, a vicious circle going on where because the basic variables weren't very good, it kind of drags everything else down. And there's a, there's a huge story attached to this building, which we could spend the whole time talking about. Now, the story here is that do not assume that green and inverted buildings are going to be, first, are going to perform, as Bill has just been saying, it is normal for them to exceed the design expectations on the energy side, but the expectations on the human side can be even worse. You know, the PR and the spin that goes with green buildings is horrifying. And I'd love to be able to show the PR and spin and the reality, you know, the reality quotes, and name the building. But we've done lots of these, and this is, this is, this is atypical. This is a horror story. But you don't often see you know, a massive green. How many have you done now? Adrian's about 800, is it? Uh, as of this morning, it was about 502. Ah. Just, and in, in, interestingly, the, the work that's coming through at the moment is a lot of PhDs around the world are now using this. They, 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 they will take this off-the-shelf off licensed method because they then don't have to spend a year of their three years no reinventing the wheel. We license this free to PhDs. And the work that's coming through at the moment is more domestic than non-domestic. There's a sudden spurt in, in interest in domestic work. And this morning, earlier on, I was working on a study where a PhD at, um, um, I've forgotten the university conveniently, because I'll get hissed anyway. She's just done 280 flats in the Barbican, survey room, which is a formidable effort. How the, you know, how she did it, it's unbelievable. She's got a fantastic data set built 
using this technique. Sorry, I can go on, but I don't, I better not.